Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are looking at uh, this uh, recording. I'm Alexandre Bonvin, I'm a professor of computational structural biology at the Bifood Center for Biomolecular Research at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and I'm a partner also in the BioXL Center of Excellence. And today I'm going to speak to you about integrative modeling of biomolecular complexes. And what you are seeing here in the background is actually a beautiful picture of uh, the region of Pula, where this summer school used to be before the pandemic, and where we surely hope to go back once things will have returned to normal, hopefully. So these are the topics I want to cover uh, today with you. I will give you a general introduction to set the stage, and then I want to cover some general aspects of docking, discussing different approaches to modeling complexes, and then focus more specifically on ad hoc and how you can integrate information to guide the modeling process. In the second part of my lecture, I will show you different application examples and how you can use different types of data to model antibody antigen complexes, use mass spectrometry data or cryo EM data to guide the modeling process. And I will end uh, with the topic of membrane complexes, which are notoriously difficult to model or to study experimentally as well. So, what are we speaking about in general? We are speaking here about the social network of proteins. And what you're seeing in this picture is a view of the center of Utrecht, which is a beautiful city you should definitely visit if you have the chance. And you see a lot of terraces, a lot of microscopic interaction at the human level. And if you think of life at the cellular microscopic level, everything which is happening is pretty much controlled by interactions between biomolecules. And proteins are playing a very important role in those interactions. So if we want to understand what's happening at a cellular atomistic level, we need to basically uh, shed light on those interactions. And this brings me to the concept of the interactome. So what you're seeing here is a lot of dots connected by lines. The dots represent proteins, the lines represent interaction between those. And if you do statistics on those, you will realize that there are many more connections than there are dots, meaning that proteins, biomolecules in general, interact with multiple other biomolecules. So this is a complex network, which is also dynamical. It's going to be rewired depending on where you are in a cell and at which time you are of the cell cycle. And if miscommunication happens in those networks, this usually leads, uh, uh, led to disease. So to understand what's happening in this complex network, we need also to be able to add the structural dimensions to what looks here like a more two-dimensional network. And this brings us to the structural biology of interactions where you have here on the right side the more experimental method and on the left side the more um, theoretical method to study complexes, interactions. And here, of course, you find the classical structural biology method like X-ray crystallography, which has been contributing the majority of structure in the protein database, nuclear magnetic resonance and cryo-electron microscopy these days, which is really the, the new star in structural biology, which is contributing a lot of very uh, complex assemblies, a uh, lot of information on complexes. But next to those, say, three key methods that are, provide you, are providing you atomistic information on, on structure of complexes and proteins in general, there is a lot of other experimental methods that are providing you pieces of the puzzles. So these might not give you the full atomic, uh, atomistic picture. So here you see mass spectrometry, which is playing now a day an increasing role in structural biology. Uh, but also small angle X-rays, small angle scattering, FRET, basically any experimental method that can give you a bit of information on, on how molecule interact is uh, useful, but you will have to combine this information with computational approach if you want to go to uh, atomistic description of those interactions. And this brings us to the, the part of on the computations, and there are different ways of uh, looking at complexes, you can try to generate those by homology modeling simply, provided there is enough information in a protein database. So you can find an homologous template, which is for complexes, it's not that uh, easy because there are, we have over 150,000 structures or 170,000 structures in a PDB these days. But there is probably only around six to 7,000 real biological complexes represented in a PDB. So it's a subset, it's a small subset of this interactome. The interactome I showed you before, as a size of several hundred thousands in humans, so it's a very complex uh, landscape. Uh, but other methods like molecular dynamics could be used to look at, at complexes and docking. 
which is the method which is central to uh, this lecture today. So to define docking in a nutshell, given the structure of two proteins, but many complexes that are formed in life consist of more than two molecules, so we need to be able to model more uh, larger and more complex assemblies as well. But uh, let's start simple. So given the structure of two molecules, can we predict how those assemble, basically? So we are trying to solve a three-dimensional puzzle by docking. What do we need to do? We will need to sample the space between those molecules, meaning sampling translations and rotations. And for all the models that we generate, we need to assess in some way if they are fitting nicely or not. Uh, this is done in different ways. We're going to come back to that. But uh, you can think simply that the shape complementarity should be important, so they should fit nicely into each other. And next to that, you can add the chemistry and the physics, and you see here electrostatic energy, the Coulomb potential, and you see a Leonard Jones potential to describe von der Waals interaction. So this is docking in a nutshell. Now, so what do we have to do if you think of docking? So we have some kind of conformational landscape, or maybe better said, interaction landscape. And we have some kind of measure of the interaction, so the energy between those molecules. And we need to sample this energy surface in order to ideally locate the minimum, which we will assume correspond to the native real structure of the complex. So this is the sampling phase. So we need to sample the space. And in this sampling phase, we're going to generate a multitude of solutions, and then we need to score them to identify basically the most likely native solutions, that the scoring part. So, so docking consists of sampling and scoring. Now, if you have data, which can be experimental or bioinformatic data, you might decide to use those data, and you can do that in two ways. You can use the data during the sampling, so we're going to bias the sampling and no longer sample the entire space, or we can use the data in the scoring to improve the energy functions that we have and help in finding the right solution to the problem. And this is an illustration of the two strategies. So if we don't use the data during sampling, then we have to search to do a global search of all possible interactions, all possible arrangements of the different molecules, and then we'll have to score them. If we use the data during the search, so we're going to, basically the data are going to describe uh, or focus the search on a small region of the interaction space, so we can spend maybe more time searching in this region, and we have less problem, hopefully, in the scoring phase. So this is beneficial, but this has also dangers because if the data are bad or are pointing to the wrong region of space, you're never going to find the right solution. So there are good things by doing, say, purely a initial search where you could cover the entire space, and there are good things by using information-driven search techniques, but we have to trust the data. So when we speak of integrative modeling in these days, we are speaking basically of the combination of different information sources, experimental sources, together with modeling, often docking, to try to find the solutions to the structural modeling of a complex. And you see here an illustration of some of the information sources that can be combined. This is by no means uh, covering everything. So you might be able to measure some kind of distance information. There are many ways to derive distance information. So you see a, a power magnetic relaxation enhancement. So this is NMR-based uh, measurements, electron um, power magnetic resonance, EPR, FRET. So those will tell you some kind of, of information about residues that are potentially close to each other in space. Cross-linking detected by mass spectrometry is also giving you specific information about say, maximum distance between uh, two residues. NMR is giving you a lot of information, so even if you cannot, uh, say, collect the classical information to solve the structure by NMR, you might still be able to map the interaction sites between these so-called NMR interpretations, so you know where things are binding, but you don't know how they are binding. NMR might give you information about the relative orientation of molecule. There are different experimental sources for that. HD exchange, also a very popular technique these days in combination with mass spectrometry, will again allow you to detect interfaces without telling you how the arrangement is, but you know where the action is, where the binding is. But it can be as simple as doing mutagenesis together with some binding assay where you identify mutations that are preventing the binding and you will interpret that those are important for the binding, hence they must be at the interface. Uh, 
shape information coming from, say, medium to low resolution cryo-electron microscopy. Not all EM these days reaches atomic resolution. Small angle X-ray scattering, so this is shape information, and this is, again, valuable information. And if you don't have experimental data, you might still have, uh, uh, we still have sequence, and you can do bioinformatic prediction, so you can try to predict binding interfaces, but you can also try to predict contact between proteins in a form of coevolution. So coevolution is a field which has been developing a lot these days. It's also at the basis of the success of Google and DeepMind with AlphaFold for the prediction of structure of, pro of proteins. But you can also use this information to define, to identify predict distances between residue, between molecules. So all of these can be combined with some modeling approach, docking, to generate structure of complexes. Here is a number of, of reviews. Uh, the, the last two are rather recent one that we wrote on a field of integrative modeling of complexes, but also modeling at the coarse grain level. And we have some uh, previous uh, review on the topic. And there is also uh, every two to three years a special issue of proteins coming out, which is dedicated to the CAPRI experiment. And CAPRI is a blind experiment to predict the structure of complexes. So CAPRI is the equivalent of CAS for structure prediction, but CAPRI focuses on the complexes. So if you want to know what the field is doing, you can look up what's happening there. So this was my general introduction. So let's move now into more specific aspects of uh, docking technology methodology. So what are the choices that you have to make when it comes to docking, modeling complexes? So first, we have to think about how to represent the system. In the simple example I showed you at the beginning, so we are speaking the shape, there should be shape complementarity. So do you need to represent all atoms or can you deal only with shape? So these are choices that have to be made. Then you have to, to, to make choice on, on how to search this interaction space, this complex energy landscape. If we assume that the molecules are rigid, we will have to sample free rotations and free translation. You can fix one molecule at the origin of space, and what you need to do for the second molecule is sample all translations in three dimensions and for each, and also sample all rotation. And for each rotation that you sample, you need to do this translational search. So it's a six-dimensional search problem for two molecules, assuming they are rigid. But of course, biomolecules and proteins are not rigid, and dynamic is part of the function. So we'll have to deal with the flexibility in some way as well. We'll have to think about how to score all those models that we're generating. So how are we going to fish for the best model? How are we going to handle flexibility and conformational changes? Some of the choices that you make here will impact on what you can do here. And also, if you have experimental data or bioinformatic data, how are you going to use those in the modeling process? So, in terms of representation of system, the first docking algorithm were using an explicit representation of the system where all atoms were described. So we have the coordinates of all atoms, and when we do the translation and rotation, we are rotating those coordinates. Uh, the first docking algorithm was written by Shoshana Vodak and Joel Jana. This is late 70s, early uh, 80s. So this is a real space search. And you see here an example, so this is an antibody-antigen complex, so this is the antibody, and here you have the antigen. Um, most techniques, uh, so, so well, you will find docking software that use explicit representation, and you will find docking software that use grid-based representation. Uh, grid has a lot of advantages, so you, you might just simplify the description of the system, you don't need to work with all the atoms anymore. And the concept here is that you basically put a grid around your molecule, and then you digitalize, digitalize your molecule onto those, onto those grids. So here you have an example of a tyrosine side chain. So you will define the surface, so you will assign properties to grid points, or to the voxels, actually, of your grid. You see here in bluish color the surface, and you see the inside of your molecule as being gray. And then once you have digitalized your protein onto those grids, what you are using for the search is only the grids. And you're going to match grids against each other. And in doing that, you want typically to, over, to maximize the overlap between the blue region, because this will be uh, a good shape complementarity. And you want to avoid overlap between the gray regions, because these will be atomic clashes. And there are many software that are using this approach of discretizing the 3D structure of your molecule onto the grid. Here is an example of uh, 
bigger, which is an older docking software. You can also play with the resolution by changing the grid spacing, uh, meaning that you could do your search at a lower resolution or higher resolution. And the search can be done in real space again, where you move your, your grids basically, or in full space. What you also have is our uh, systems that use a mixed representation of, uh, of your molecules. This is done more in the small molecule docking field, where you're basically representing here on a grid the energetic field coming from your protein, and the ligand, the small molecule, is described explicitly. And the small molecule is moving in this grid, which represents the energy contribution of the protein. So this is implemented, for example, in Autodoc and ICM. So this is a mixed representation. I mentioned at the beginning that maybe we only need to represent the surface of the molecule and that we can forget about the inside. And this is what is being done, what is being done in a software like HEX, which was developed by the late Dave Ritchie. And here we are basically using a combination of spherical harmonics. So spherical harmonics are mathematical functions, uh, trigonometric functions, and you see here uh, a number of those. Uh, they are also used typically to represent the electronic orbitals of, uh, of atoms. And you can use a linear combination of those functions to represent a 3D shape. And this is what HEX is doing. So instead of working with thousands of coordinates of atoms, HEX is using actually a linear combination of 45 uh, spherical harmonics. You have to optimize the weight of those to match the shape of your protein. So you see here a, a surface representation of two protein, protein receptor and a ligand, and this will be the shape representation of those two. And you only need basically 2 times 45 uh, coefficients to represent those two. And then the search will be done in this spherical harmonic space. So, which makes this kind of approach extremely fast in terms of computing. By varying the number of uh, components of terms in this, uh, that you are using to describe your molecule, you can also change the resolution of your system. There's one last representation that I want to mention here, are, uh, and this is basically the idea of representing molecule as a 3D puzzle. So if you think of a 3D puzzle, you have all the puzzle pieces. So what you are doing here is to decompose the surface of your molecule into puzzle pieces based on the surface curvature. Is it convex, concave? So you can basically decompose this uh, protein into a number of puzzle pieces. And when you are trying to solve a puzzle, you don't take all the pieces together and try to find a solution to your puzzle, but you take one piece and you are searching for the corresponding piece that will be matching. And you will do the same now in the docking. So you take one piece of your receptor and you look in all the pieces from the ligands which one does match in terms of shape, curvature, and all of that. And that's a very fast process. It's called geometric hashing. And this is implemented in a software like PatchDoc, which is again a very fast software because of this uh, type of uh, implementation. So this was about how to represent the system in, uh, in docking. So now we go into the search method. So how do we search the space? There are different ways. So there are first the approach, the docking approach, that do a systematic search. So we're going to systematically sample all rotations and all translations. And for two molecules, these are three rotations and three translations. Again, you can fix one molecule in space at the origin, and you need to rotate the second one and translate for each rotation translated. And for each orientation that you calculate, uh, you need to generate a score. And the scoring can become a very expensive part depending on how complex your energy functions are. Now, the translational search is often carried out uh, in Fourier space when you use grid-based techniques. Uh, so if you digitalize your protein onto a grid, since grids are uh, equal spacing of points, then you can use fast Fourier transformation techniques to do the translational search in one go. HEX, which uses the spherical harmonics, does the rotational search in free space, because there are properties of rotational of spherical harmonics that makes that very efficient as well. Now, example of such software that are grid-based are ZDoc, very famous one, uh, Plus Pro, Gram, FTDoc, uh, where they are using basically grid to do the search and do a systematic search of all possible solutions. So how does it work? So you see here a system of consisting of two molecules, so for the receptor, which typically will be your largest of the two molecules, 
you're going to discretize it on the grid. The size of the grid depends on the size of the largest molecule. And you're going to define properties to the grid voxel. So you see here the surface again in a bluish representation and the core in a red representation. So this you only need to do once because the receptor is fixed in space. For the ligands, you need to sample rotations. And then for each rotation, you're going to discretize the molecule onto the grid, a grid which has exactly the same dimension as the grid of your receptor. And once you have those two grids, you're going to calculate, you take the fast Fourier transformation of the grid, which gives you the complex conjugate, and then in the Fourier space, you do the correlation function of those grids. And this gives you in one shot, basically, uh, a sampling of all the translation in the system. So what you see here is a two-dimensional example. If you do the correlation uh, in Fourier space, you get this kind of uh, information where you have all the translations that are possible, and for each combination you see a, a measure of the correlation coefficients, and this depends on how you define your, your functions, but in this case we want to maximize the overlap between the blue regions and avoid overlap between the red regions. So there's a way of calculating how, basically the score. And the highest points here in this are the ones that will be giving you the best matches between the molecule. And you're going to store those highest points, and then you do a different rotation of your system, you do your uh, Fourier transformation correlation in Fourier space, and you store the highest coefficients. Once you have those, you can generate your 3D model by taking the inverse uh, Fourier transformation for a given combination of uh, coefficients, and this is giving you basically your complex. So this is how docking is happening in fast, using fast Fourier transformation and grids. Now, systematic search, uh, it can be done in different ways. You can do it uh, stepwise, where you might start at low resolution to speed up the computations and then increase the re uh, resolution, and at the same time use maybe simple scoring function at the beginning, again, for computing uh, time purposes, and then go to more fancy scoring functions when you increase the resolution. Usually, when you do uh, this kind of systematic grid-based search, you need to refine the solutions because there will be clashes at the interfaces. You also have methods that are energy-driven. So now uh, we're not going to use this grid and fast Fourier transformation, but we use conformational search techniques with the aim of minimizing some kind of energy function. Uh, so you can think of energy minimization, molecular dynamics, Brownian dynamics, Monte Carlo, genetic algorithms, swarm-based algorithms, and in all those you will find software, docking software, that implements some of those methods, or a combination of those methods, and often in combination with some kind of simulated annealing scheme. Now, if you're doing these energy-driven search methods, you're going to minimize the energy of the system, so you need a starting point for this. And that's uh, something that, uh, that needs to, to be carefully thought about. Uh, different methods, different software implement different methods. So here you see an example of ICM, and actually ATTRACT, another famous docking software, use a rather similar approach, where you basically define pins on the surface of your molecule, and you can put them at equidistant points uh, along the surface. And then you take a starting point for your minimization or for your energy sampling, basically, uh, all possible combination of those pins. Another approach will be to apply random rotation from the system, separate the molecule, and then start a minimization or an optimization process from all those uh, different starting points, which is what we do in ad hoc, for example. So you need to sample a lot, so you need to have many starting points, and for all of these, you're going to try to optimize the energy of the system. Now, what about flexibility? Flexibility makes everything more complicated. It makes the docking problem harder. So we have no longer only three degrees of freedom, or three rotation and three translations, but we also need to sample internal degrees of freedom, allow for side chain motions, allow for loop motions, and that makes everything more complex. Also, the scoring becomes more difficult. A big problem that we have in the field is it's very difficult to predict a priori if conformational changes are going to take place when something is binding. Uh, if we were able to do that, uh, then it, it might make the docking problem easier in the sense that we know that in specific cases we have to play tricks to sample conformational space. 
But if you don't need conformational changes for the binding and you're going to play a lot of tricks and use fancy methods, usually the outcome of the docking is usually worse. So knowing when you need it and when you don't need it, I think is, is also very important. So most docking methods these days can only handle rather small conformational changes. We use benchmarks in the field and one of the cutoff which is used to define is it a challenging docking problem or is it or not is only 2.5 angstrom root mean square deviation uh, of the conformations between the free conformations and the bond conformation of the complex. So 2.5 is not a lot, but 2.5 is enough already to make the problem very hard. How you're going to deal with flexibility depends on the method that you choose for the sampling. So the two are interconnected. So one way of dealing with that, which, which can be applied to many different search methods, is what is called soft docking, where instead of having hard spheres to represent atoms or molecules, we allow some kind of overlap between those. So this is an implicit way of representing flexibility, uh, but the outcome of this kind of docking will have to be refined to remove those bumps. Uh, another way of, of, dealing, uh, of, of doing this kind of soft docking will be to shave the side chain at the, inside, at the surface of your protein. So you see, again, a grid. Um, if you have overlap of grid, grid points during the docking, this is a bad thing. So you could empty the grid points of the side chain on the surface and say, okay, if I have overlap in this region, it's not, it's not penalizing my solution. So that's an implicit way of doing uh, this kind of soft docking. And this is something that is done typically in grid-based docking algorithms. What you can also do is to start the docking not from a single structure, but use ensembles of conformations to do your docking process. Depending on software that you are doing, you're using, you might have to repeat the docking for each conformation, and some of the software will take all the conformation at the same time during the docking process. Now, those conformations can come from, for example, different crystal structure, NMR ensembles, or you can use techniques like molecular dynamics or normal modes to generate and sample possible conformations of your system. And this is applicable both to rigid and flexible docking approaches. And then, if you have methods that allow for flexibility explicitly, so you're going to use here energy minimization, molecular dynamics type, Monte Carlo, you can have explicit flexibility in your system, which can be limited to sidechain or sidechain and backbone. This, of course, increases the computational course, uh, the cost, so this is typically used later in the pipeline, in the docking pipeline, to refine the models. And then, uh, last, scoring. So we've been speaking about how to represent the system, how to search the space, to deal with flexibility. We generate a lot of models, so how do we know which one are the correct one or the near native one? And this is really the holy grail in docking. So if you can figure out what the perfect scoring function is, the remaining of the problem is just computing time. So assuming we have infinite computing time, then we should always get uh, the right solution out of our modeling. But we don't have infinite computing time, and our scoring functions are not perfect. How you score also depends on how you represent the system and how you deal with flexibility. And in the field, you will see that there are scoring functions that are also very specific to the type of system that you are modeling. In principle, nature only has one set of laws that govern molecular recognition. But in practice, people might be tuning their scoring function to a specific type of system because it performs better for this answer. But it doesn't make them uh, generally applicable. So what do you find in those scoring functions? In a nutshell, you will find terms that are related to the Van der Waals interactions, and usually you're calculating the intermolecular component of the Van der Waals energy, the intermolecular component of the electrostatic energy. You might be looking for specific hydrogen bonds between the molecule. You might be measuring the amount of surface which is buried between the molecule. Uh, dissolvation energies, that are some, some way of representing the gain of energy or the loss of energy when you remove solvent from the surface of the molecule. You might use uh, statistics or so statistical potentials. Um, so there are different ways of uh, different scoring function. You find all kinds of combinations out there. And if you have data, if you have experimental data, you can, of course, also use the data to filter your solution. And that's a very good way of uh, uh, selecting solutions, actually. 
So surface-related terms, they are typically based on the solvent accessible surface area, which was introduced by Fred Richards. Um, so you measure the amount of surface of a molecule, and when it comes to complexes, what is relevant is the area which is buried upon complex formation, which is called the buried surface area. And this is basically the difference between the accessible surface area of the separated molecule and the surface area of the complex. So this difference gives you the buried area. And typical values for proteins complexes range between 1200 and uh, say 2500 square angstrom, but you will find complexes that are way larger interfaces, and you will also find complexes that are smaller interface and still are binding very strongly. The dissolvation energy is also an imp empirical function, which is a function of the solvent accessible surface area of atoms. So you can calculate that per atom times some kind of parameter, which is a function of the type of atom. So an oxygen will have different properties than a carbon when it comes to calculating the solvation energy. And the dissolvation energy, as for the buried surface area, is basically, basically the difference of the solvation energy of the separate free molecule minus the solvation energy of the complex. Pair potentials, statistical potentials, so these are uh, been introduced quite some time ago and you see here one example based on an analysis of the protein database where you see amino acid, amino acid potentials, but you also have atomistic potentials uh, that are out there. Defire is a scoring function which is used quite a lot in the field both for calculating the, the quality of predictions of single structures, but also in complexes. And basically you obtain those functions by doing statistics on the PDB and you will have combination of amino acids in this example that are favorable, that are giving you a positive uh, a gain in energy and you have combinations that are unfavorable. So this is based on statistics basically. And you're basically measuring how well does a model that you generate uh, matches what you find in a PDB. And this is implemented in different software. So in general, the more sophisticated the scoring function that you are using for your modeling, the more time it will cost as well. So there's always the balance of, you know, how much time do you have to get results? Um, so you can do very fancy things, uh, but uh, it might take a very long time to get a result. Uh, uh, finally, when we look at models, you might be generating, we might be sampling, you know, millions, billions of solutions when you do docking. Um, and you, of course, only keep uh, the best ones, but the best one might still be a large number, a few hundred, a few thousands. So what is also often done in the field is to cluster the solutions. So we put the solutions that resemble each other into a bag, and instead of scoring at an individual structure base, we score at a cluster base. Some software even use the size of the cluster as a scoring uh, method. It depends very much on how you are doing the sampling, if the size is uh, a proper uh, parameter or not. And there are different ways of doing this clustering, so you need to measure the similarity of two models. This can be done based on RMSDs, positional RMSDs, but this can also be done based on the contact that are made between the molecule, the fraction of common contact, which is something we introduced. So these were all the general aspects about docking, and now I want to come to more specific aspects of docking with ad hoc, so information-driven docking with ad hoc. So Haddock has been developed for more than yeah, almost 20 years by now, and it was developed because to make use of experimental information from the start. So actually these were limitations that we had in solving structure by NMR of complex, which basically gave us the idea to, to develop this docking approach, where we incorporate data to guide the modeling process. And over the years we have added support for a large variety of data, and I'm going to show you some application in the second part of the talk. I mentioned also that many complexes consist of more than two molecules, so in Haddock we are currently able to dock up to 20 molecules. But going to that large amount of molecules only makes sense if you have data. If you don't have data, this is a pure waste of time. Symmetry is also something that we can uh, leverage in the docking because it limits the solutions that you have to generate. And as you will see, Haddock is a software that allows for flexi ex explicit flexibility during the, the refinement stage. And we have been participating to this blind competition over the years with a good performance over the years. So how do we encode the information that we have at hand in Haddock? So 
many uh, of the information that we get is telling you that some regions or some residues are important for the binding, but it's not telling you how the binding takes place, so which contacts are made. And the way to encode that into some kind of energy function is to use what we called ambiguous interaction restraints. So we have an example here of two molecules, so you have protein A and protein B, and we have identified, for example, from mutagenesis, that those red amino acids are important for the binding, and this one for side B. But we don't know which contacts are made. The green ones that you see here are what we called uh, the passive residues. These will be the surface neighbors of the active. So we want to have a good definition, good coverage of the binding site, which is why we usually pick the surface neighbors of what has been identified experimentally to increase a bit our definition of the binding site. And then we're going to define distance restraints between each red residue that you see here and the entire interface on the other side. So each red residue will have one distance restraint, which has a functional form like this one. This is a typical energy function used in NMR structure calculation. So it's harmonic for it has, it has zero energy between an upper and lower limit, then it's harmonic for the lower limit. And then on the higher distance side, it's harmonic for a short period and it becomes linear. And this linear function has the advantage that the forces here are not constant. And the forces is what is driving the molecular dynamics and energy minimization. So how do we calculate the distance that goes into this function uh, in the case of these highly ambiguous distances? So we take all possible combination of atomic atomic distances between all atom of a residue I and all atom of the entire interface on the other side. So we take all possible combinations and all those combinations of distances we sum up as one over the distance to the six. And at the end, we take the inverse six root of that distance. And this is giving you one effective distance. And this one effective distance is what goes into this energy function. This, is, this will be this R value here. So each residue has effectively one distance restraint, but to the entire interface on the other side. And this summation here has the property that this distance here is always shorter than the shortest distance that enters the sum. So at the end, you are basically satisfying your energy function as soon as some short distances exist between the interface. So these ambiguous restraints have the property, so you have this network of ambiguous distance between the interface, so this has the property that is going to draw the molecule toward each other without predefining what the orientation should be. So you can sample different orientations, uh, but you will make sure that the residue that you define as active should be part of the interface. So that's really the, the basis of ad hoc. Since the restraints or since the experimental information or predicted information might not always be reliable, so we will have false positive, false negative, what we do by default is to typically remove randomly 50% of the information for each talking trial that we are doing. And we might even remove up to 90% in cases when you use bioinformatic predictions. So how do we uh, calculate the interaction between the molecule and how do we search this energy landscape? So we define uh, an energy function, which is a classical force field, which is also used in molecular dynamics, where we have bonds between atoms, angles, torsions around bonds, and the non-bonded interactions, von der Waals electrostatic. These are important for molecular recognition. And on top of these classical, say, force field terms, we add an energy function that represents the experimental data. And the search in this energy landscape is done by a combination of energy minimization and molecular dynamics simulations. So we have typically three stages in Haddock. In the first stage, the molecules are treated as rock solid, rigid, and we perform an energy minimization driven by the data that we put in. So you see here the process of this energy minimization and the spheres are amino acids that were detected by NMR to be important for the interaction. So this sampling is done between 10 and 100,000 times typically. We take the best model, and then we subject those models to a simulated annealing protocol in torsion angle space. So we do now molecular dynamics in torsion angle space, and we add flexibility at the interface and also along the side chain and the backbone. Look at this loop, it just flipped over. So this is an optimization of the interface between the molecule. And which residue are optimized is automatically defined by default based on the contact that are made between the molecule. 
At the end, we take those solutions and we use to put them in a bath of water and then do a very, very short molecular dynamic simulations. In the latest version of Haddock, we don't do that by default anymore. We do only a minimization because at the end, the, the models are not changing that much. Still, the energetic changes. So the option to add water is still there, but we don't do it by default. In terms of flexibility, when we speak of ad hoc, there are different levels. So we have an implicit flexibility. We can dock from ensemble structure, as I explained to you. But also explicit, as you've seen in the movies, we allow for explicit flexibility along side chain and backbone. So in summary, we have three stages, rigid body minimization, simulated annealing in torsion angle space, and refinement in explicit solvent and Cartesian space. And these are the scoring functions that we use at the different stage, and this is the scoring function that we use at the end to select the final model. It has 20% of the intermolecular electrostatic energy, 100% of the intermolecular van der Waals energy, the dissolvation energy term, which I explained to you before, and the experimental uh, contributions. So you have these intermolecular energies. In blue, you have the dissolvation, so basically the price of or or benefit of removing water from the interface, and then you have the experimental information. We also do clustering of solutions, and uh, actually, typically, we score on a cluster basis. Most of uh, Haddock's users are using our web portal, which is available from WeNMR Science UNL. So we have more than 22,000 registered users to date, and it has served a large number of docking runs since 2008. And we are able to provide those resources because we have access to grid resources distributed worldwide through projects support with the support of the European Grid Initiative, EGI, and the European Open Science Cloud, among others. You can also uh, get the software to run locally, but there you will have to do much more manual intervention while the server does a lot for you. This is a, a short overview of our current user base, where we have more than 22,000, and you see that uh, worldwide it's used all over the place with a lot of usage in Asia, but also in the US and all of Europe combined. We have seen in last year that uh, a significant increase in the use of our portal, because Haddock is being used to model a lot of complex related to uh, COVID, actually. So we see this COVID effect. So this was the start of the lockdown in April, and we've seen almost a triple in the number of submissions to the portal. And about one third of all the submissions since April last year are COVID related. So users can tag their submission as COVID. And this is also the number of single users, uh, unique users per month. And you see that, uh, so this is again April 2020, you see that at the start of the pandemic, uh, this has more than double. And this is so we see actually the wave also the of the pandemic reflected in the usage of the portal. And you find here Captain Haddock. If you think that Haddock is only a fish, uh, Haddock is also a, a cartoon figure. This is not a real album of Tintin and the coronavirus, but actually that's something that you find in the internet. This is a combination of uh, Tintin going to the moon and Tintin and the blue lotus, which is happening in China. So people have been forcing the the pandemic here. Now, Haddock, I already mentioned it, is a core software in the BioXL Center of Excellence. As such, we are operating a forum under BioXL where you can ask questions, you can search for answers to your question, but you can also ask uh, questions directly and get answers to that. So that's our help center. And next to Haddock, which is our core software in, uh, in Utrecht, we are also operating a lot of other softwares that are relevant to uh, uh, different aspect of modeling interactions. So, as last, a very short example, you see here again Captain Haddock, now as a pirate, and this particular example has to do with iron piracy. Um, this is how a bacteria is actually uh, hijacking iron from its host. And it's doing that by using this receptor, uh, FUS A, and FUS A is uh, binding to ferredoxin from the host. Uh, because ferredoxin contains an iron sulfur cluster. Now, in this team of people, we have NMR people, we have X-ray people, and we have modelers ourselves. They could not manage to crystallize the complex, but they could manage to crystallize this beautiful membrane protein. Uh, but they never managed to bind the, to, to find crystal structure with the ferredoxin bound to it. By NMR, they could, however, study how ferredoxin binds to the uh, to the receptor. 
So they did an NMR titration, so you see an amino acid sequence, and you see some kind of displacement of the NMR signal. And you see there are specific regions along the sequence that are affected by the binding. And if you map those on the surface of your protein, they map to a very specific region. So this is the region which is interacting with the receptor. So this is information that we can use in ad hoc to guide the bonding process. On the membrane side, they could not do the NMR, but we also have information because we know which loops are the extracellular loop of this receptor, and this is where the binding has to take place. So we can define this region, those extracellular loop, as the binding region for the red region here of our ligand. And this is the information that we give to Haddock. And Haddock returns you a number of clusters. You see here the first two clusters that are actually quite close in space. And this is the top solution. So based on these models, you should go back to the lab, devise experiments to try to validate which one of those two solutions is the most likely correct one, doing mutagenesis, for example. This was not done yet in the, when the paper was published, but hopefully uh, it will be done. So with that, I want to close this first part of my lecture, and I thank you very much for your attention so far. And I will see you for the second part. Thanks.